1700 through 1776. Can we get along? And can Christianity survive? The second talk in a series on Christianity in America was presented by Tim McIntosh on February 27, 2013, at an evening class of McKinsey Study Center and Institute of Gutenberg College. The copyright for this recording is held by Gutenberg College, Inc., 2013. Gutenberg College is a nonprofit organization, and contributions may be made at www.gutenberg.edu. This material may be copied and distributed in whole for non-commercial and educational purposes, subject to the inclusion of this introduction. All of their rights reserved. Week out of ten about the history of the church in America or Christianity in the United States, whatever you want to call it. And I said this last week, I'm going to repeat it every, every week. I'm kind of trying to structure the 10 classes after challenges that kind of approach the Christian church or maybe Americans broadly. Last week, the challenge was, how do you start a Christian civilization? Because that's what the Puritans were up to. They came to the United States from England not just because they wanted religious freedom, of course they wanted that, but they wanted to start a Christian civilization. And they wanted England to so admire this civilization that they would call over to the Puritans, hey, you guys were right after all. Will you come back and let's do this over here? So um, the Puritans, I'm doing a little review right now. The Puritans, when they leave, when they get on the ship to come to the colonies, to come to the New World, their guy, their leader, gets up in front of all of them. They're about to get on the boat, and he uh, gives this famous sermon in which he likens them, the new colony that they're going to found, to a city on a hill. It's a phrase that American presidents will repeat very frequently. Its meaning will change down through the centuries, but the Puritans think of themselves as a city on the hill um, that England will look at and want to emulate eventually. So the Puritans' kind of lasting effects in the United States is something I'm going to refer to over and over in these classes because I kind of am convinced that the United States was and maybe even continues to be kind of a continuation of the Puritan project. And I'll explain more what I mean by that. That can sound a little confusing if you think the Puritan project, the Puritans are like really, really morally rigid. That's what the Puritans are. I mean something much broader than that. I'll touch on it very briefly, and I'll touch on it in the continuing weeks, what I mean by the Puritan Project. In short, what I mean is the Puritans kind of give seed to democracy and to self-rule, not just in the way that they structure their town hall meetings, not just the fact that they introduce secret ballots for the first time maybe in human history, not just because they develop this sense of like um, covenants in which individuals covenant with their towns to do business, to own property, to become members of a church. Um, But the most important thing is the Puritans have this sense of like individual moral responsibility before God. And so self-governance is mandatory, mandatory for them. And I think in that sense, that has continued in the United States. I get the sense that maybe it's waning. It's been waning during the last couple of generations. But that has been something that Americans have prided themselves on. You just take care of it yourself. You govern yourself. And there's sort of like a resistance of being governed from a political entity. Okay, so the two challenges that we're talking about today are this. Uh, and the time period that I'm going to cover is roughly 1700 to the American Revolution, roughly 1700 to 1776. The two challenges are this. First, can we get along? Can the American colonists get along? This is a huge issue. Can anybody think of why? And if you say why, I'll repeat it in the mic. You might think of why this would be such a big deal in the early colonies, just getting along. What's, what's happening over in Europe? Or what has happened recently over in Europe? Strife. strife. What sort of strife, Sam? Right. Right, wars between Catholics and Protestants, the Thirty Years' War, I have the dates somewhere, uh, mid-1600s, Catholics and Protestants are, are killing each other, not figuratively, literally. 
There's a peace that comes at the end of the Thirty Years' War called the Peace of Westphalia. So Europe involved in this huge religious fight. It's not just between Catholics and Protestants, but the Protestants have already broken up into about five different major groups. Uh, Reformed churches, Lutheran churches, Anabaptist churches. Oh, uh, I'll think of the others in a second. So they've broken up already into distinct groups. And the peace, of West, the peace of Westphalia, which ends the Thirty Years' War, ends it by drawing up geographical boundaries. Okay, you Lutherans, you've got to stay in Germany and you've got to stay in the Scandinavian areas. Uh, Catholics, you guys are going to stay in Spain and Portugal. You're going to have some of France also. Okay, France is also going to have some Protestants. Um, the Swiss are going to have, they're going to be reformed. So are the Scottish. The English, you guys are Anglicans, okay? So the peace is drawn by geographical boundaries. Guess what? In the United States, that can't happen. So Lutherans are getting on the ship and coming over and moving into a neighborhood, moving into a little town, and they're moving into a town in which they have neighbors that are Swiss reformed or, oh my goodness, Catholic. So they can't just parcel out land and say, you Catholics go here, you Swiss reformers go here, you Anglicans go here. We've got to work it out. And so there's this development in the United States called denominations. Denominations develop. And I'll talk about how that happens, how denominations develop. The second big challenge is um, if state, excuse me, if church membership is not obligatory, if it's not mandated, is Christianity just going to disappear? Right? So in Europe, and again, think of this, that the colonists that are coming to the colonies, excuse me, the colonists are coming overwhelmingly from Western Europe. Western Europe, there's a state church. You're baptized not just into a church, but you're baptized into the citizenship of the country that you're coming from. So they're coming over to the United States and, excuse me, they're coming over to the colonies and there's not that obligatory expectation that you're going to be baptized into a state church. At the beginning there is, but that kind of falls away relatively quickly. So those are the two challenges. Can we get along as Catholics, Protestants, Lutherans, Reformers, et cetera, et cetera? And secondly, if church membership isn't required, will Christianity survive? Again, roughly the time period I'm talking about is 1700 to 1776. So now that I've kind of got you on the hook a little bit about what we're going to discuss, I'm going to do a little brief prologue. And this is, I just like stuff like this. Have you ever just thought like, what would my life be like on a given Sunday if I lived in 1700 and I was in Virginia? Like, what would life be like then? So I'm just going to do a brief excursus about that, just because, just to kind of get a flavor of what colonial life on a Sunday was like. Uh, okay, where are we in my notes? Okay, here we go. Um, if you are a colonial family in Virginia and you go to church, you're probably an Anglican. The Anglicans, just to refresh your memory, that's the English state church that Henry VIII formed because he wanted a divorce and so he, the Pope wouldn't give him a divorce. And Henry VIII kind of wanted some land and the divorce, so he's like, I'm just going to start my own church. He does. It's the Anglican Church. When it comes to the United States, it will eventually be renamed. Do you guys know what the name of the Anglican Church? If you, The Episcopalian Church now, Episcopal Church. <laughs> I started to make a joke. My old pastor said, what are Episcopalians? They're Presbyterians with money. <laughs> he had the cre- he had the worst <laughs> jokes. He just bound to offend everybody. I I, will, I might re- repeat them every once in a while. Um, so if you are a colonial um, family living in Virginia, odds are that you, if you own a book, you've got a Bible. If you own a book, it's a Bible. Um, it's a King James Bible. Uh, if you Go to a school, there's a school set up, and you're not just being educated at home, then you're probably learning from the Bible how to read. It's your very first textbook. Uh, There's lots of evidence that lay people knew their Bible as well as preachers did. Think about how 
completely amazing this is, given the situation 100, 150 years earlier, where the Bible exists in Latin, and only people who are trained in Latin can read it, and they are priests and they are monks, a very small section of society. Now, virtually everyone not only is learning how to read, but they're also learning how to read a King James Bible. That's their primary textbook. Things have changed. There are usually two services on a Sunday morning, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. I'll talk a little bit more about what a typical service would look like in a second. Baptisms or wedding, let's say that your daughter is getting married. She would probably get married on a Sunday as part of the regular worship service. There's kind of a practical reason for this. Uh, If you're living in Virginia, you're probably a farmer. You might be a tobacco farmer, but you're probably a farmer. And so getting into town, getting to some place where they've got a church is not like crossing the street. You can't just catch a bus. It's a major event to get into church. So let's double up and have weddings and the services together. Let's go ahead and do that. So that's what they did. Also, baptisms were probably typically part of everyday Sunday worship. There were probably plenty of crying babies which is not abnormal even today, but also barking dogs in very blustery weather. Uh, Anglican churches fenced the communion table. Do you know what I mean by that term, they fenced the communion table? So um, if you go to a church and before communion is served, even today, usually the pastor will read out of 1 Corinthians in which he says, um, in which Paul writes, do not take these, do not take the wine, do not take the bread without being prepared, and do not take it if you're not committed to Christ in some way. That's called fencing the table. And so Anglican churches had a literal fence up around the communion table. And of course, it was nice looking. It wasn't just some sort of a chain link fence. It was probably kind of a little bit ornate and nice looking. But it had a kind of secondary role. Its primary role is theological. It fenced the table. Um, so that not anyone could just take the communion cup. But the secondary reason was apparently stray dogs and cats were so frequent (laughs) that you had to kind of keep them from getting up to the communion table. So they fenced the table for that reason also. Here's what a typical Sunday service looked like. Usually pretty long. Start with the singing of a metrical psalm, psalm. Then there's a call to repentance a general confession of absolution, and if you press me on what that is, I don't know. The Lord's Prayer is recited. Other liturgical prayers are recited. There's a scripture lesson. Then if there was a baptism on that day, there'd be a baptism. Then there'd probably be another psalm. Um, So you, you guys have maybe sung the doxology before. Bless God from whom all. So that would be something they would sing in Anglican uh, Virginia during the time. A recitation of the Apostles' Creed, then the sermon, then more prayers, and then the final blessing. That's probably your typical uh, Sunday service. Uh, The seating. What were you sitting on if you were a Virginian Anglican in this time? You were probably sitting on a stool or a chair so you could swing around and follow the procession of the service. It's probably not all happening up front. Popery. Beware of popery. (laughs) You know what I mean when I say that? Popery, beware of like the effects of the Roman Catholic Church who believe in a pope. The Anglicans, all the colonists are very, very sensitive about any hint of popery. As we will find out in a second. I'm going to read something. You're just not going to believe it. Um, so you probably sat on a chair or a stool so you could kind of follow the procession around. Uh, As I mentioned, the music was probably a metrical psalm that was put to music, and here's how it would go. Of course, you don't have really nice bound hymnals. No way. That's way too expensive. Um, And so what you'd probably have is you'd have a deacon calling out the tune, and then he would call the line, or he would sing the line, and you would repeat it. As a congregation, you would repeat it. You would sing it back to him. So this is called lining out or a line out. But this ran into criticism, <laughs> and here's the criticism. Um, one historian described how certain congregations resisted any formalism, even in their singing, because it smacked of popish formalism. Quote, 
to sing the usual way was to sing without regard to the time and pitch or anyone else. A singer merely took the run of the tune and then added his own little flourishes according to his own vocal talents and the inspiration of the moment, clipping some notes or hanging on to them, singing too high, others in the congregation singing too low, and all of them singing too long, performing little slidings and purrings and raising and lowerings as the heart inclined. Thereby, the singing made individual and thereby the Lord was pleased. Naturally, no one began at the same time as anyone else. While the singer in one pew was continuing into the next, into, into line three, possibly taking two breaths to one note, his neighbor in the next pew was halfway through line four and charging on to the fifth. The children of the first generation uh, colonists eventually are just like, come on, does everything have to be against the Catholics? Can't we sing in unison? And so finally they're like, yeah, okay, we can sing in unison. But just keep in mind how sensitive the colonists are to anything that smacks of hierarchy, formalism, popishness. Very, very suspicious. Okay, so that's, that's a Sunday in the life of an Anglican Virginian. Um, now let's get back to the main two challenges that are at hand. Just remind you, how can we live together? Catholics, Protestants, Reformed, um, Anglicans, Anabaptists. And secondly, is, the, is Christianity sur- going to survive without a state church? So think about, get it, let's get in the mind of a colonialist for a second. You are, you have one foot firmly in two worlds. One world is the medieval world. The other world is this new world. You are in the medieval world in this sense. Um, religious conviction is ubiquitous. So dissenting from belief in God would have been probably definitely in the 1600s and even in the first part of the 1700s, very uncommon. Very uncommon. Moreover, your view of the world, there's no such thing um, as Thomas having a private conviction that the elements of the communion table become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the way the Catholics believe. There's no sense that he can have a private conviction about that that's not a public conviction. Does that make sense? We can't have differing convictions um, and both hold them equally strong and just be like, yeah, Thomas, you believe what you believe and I believe what I'm going to believe. In a medieval world... That doesn't exist. So another term for that would be sectarian. Someone who has a kind of sectarian approach to religion or to Christianity in particular. Um, Private conviction is something that sounds very strange, maybe even unheard of. So the early colonists have a foot in that camp, but they also have a foot in the other camp, which is, well, but my neighbor is a Lutheran. What am I going to do about that? I pass them every day in the street. We're buying from the same farmer. You know, we, we, we have to do, we've got to get along. There's no choice about it. We're sharing a well. There are all these things that, um, practically speaking, we've got to work out this way that we can both hold our convictions in some way. So, adding to the importance of figuring out how to both hold convictions at the same time is this fact the population in the colonies is exploding. So between 1660 and 1760, population goes from roughly 7,500, excuse me, 75,000 in 1660, 75,000 to about 1.6 million in 1770. Huge population explosion. So a 20-fold increase in 100 years. Uh, speaking of this kind of phenomenon of seeing all these different religious persuasions all living together, a European visitor to New York wrote a letter that we still have a copy of expressing shock at how many religious beliefs there were in just this one city. He counted in New York Dutch Reformed, a few Anglicans, a few Catholics, singing Quakers, 
ranting Quakers, <laughs> pro and anti sabbatarian Baptists, Moravians, French Huguenots, Congregationalists, Jewish merchants from the West Indies, and German Lutherans. All living in the same place. He doesn't know how this is happening. So, Americans begin to blur the hard lines of sectarianism as a way to kind of just survive, get along with their neighbors. The seeds of this are found in the scriptures. The Protestants especially are going to argue this. Um, Calvin, in the preface to his Institutes to the Christian Religion, does that, so let me just make it clear, I'm so used to being with with Gutenberg students, and I can say, Calvin, Institute of the Christian Religion. Yeah, we read that. So Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion are sort of the systematic theology of the Reformation. So Martin Luther lit the Reformation. The Reformation catches on fire when he posts his 95 theses in 1517. But his approach to Christianity and kind of... um, writing the theology of the Reformation is kind of ad hoc. He responds to problems here. He responds to problems there. He does commentaries. He does these various sorts of things. But he's not writing a full systematic, this is the full flowering of what our um, theology is going to be like. That job fell to Calvin. So Calvin, a French lawyer living in Switzerland, or maybe he was a Swiss, I can't remember. I think he's French. Um, he writes the Institutes of the Christian Religion in the preface to the Christian Religion, Institutes of the Christian Religion. This is what he writes. Our controversy turns on these hinges. First, the Catholics contend that the form of the church is always apparent and observable. That is, it is visible. We, the Protestants, on the other hand, affirm that the church can exist without any visible appearance and that its appearance is not contained within that outward magnificence which they, the Pope, uh, the Catholics, foolishly admired. Does that make sense? So for Calvin, the church, the real church, meaning the individuals who truly believe in Jesus Christ, who are destined to be saved, that is invisible. That's the real church, and that's invisible. Whereas the Catholics would say, time out. The church is visible. It's not just the building, but it's the people who do the sacraments, baptism, marriage, the Eucharist. All these things are visible and tangible. For Calvin, Calvin's like, but you can take the Eucharist, you can take communion and have your heart be absolutely black against God. Thus, the church The real believers, only God really knows who these people are. That's the invisible church. So this is a huge distinction between the Catholics and the Protestants. Catholics say the church is visible. There are signs that show that you're on your way to being saved, whereas the Protestants, particularly the Reformers, will say, no, it's invisible. So can you see how denominationalism can kind of be birthed out of this? The Protestants, of course, acknowledge that real church buildings can be shown. But you could not point to the real church since that was known only to God. Thus, different denominations could contain believers, Baptists, Presbyterians, eventually Methodists, Lutherans. They might all contain members of the invisible church without the denominations claiming exclusive rights to the invisible church. This is... I mean, I, I'm going to weigh in every once in a while. This is a great development. This is, this is not only, I think, going back to like what the scripture teaches. It's also we managed to save our own. We managed to keep ourselves from killing each other also. This is a great development. Here's the other problem we're going to discuss. If church membership isn't required, if there's no state church, will Christianity survive? During this time that I'm talking about, the early 1700s, there's, this is a time of exceptional business success and also a huge increase in the population. So many people, early colonists, have come to the states to make money. The Puritans came for expressly religious reasons, and many others came for express, expressly religious reasons, but many, especially in Virginia, 
seemed like they came – it was a good way to make some money. So the early col- colonialists faced this question. In the old world, church membership was a right of citizenship. Baptism was not just baptism into God's church but into citizenship. But now church membership was not required. Yes, in certain Bible-based communities like the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay, it was, but even by 1662, this is not a sustainable project. Even the Puritans are like, yeah, we can't collapse these two things together, church membership, like political membership. We can't collapse those two things together. So does that mean if Christianity is just voluntary – and not obligatory? Is it doomed to just fizzle away? Can you imagine how this might even be a bigger challenge than the one of like living next to different sectarian beliefs? So how do the early colonialists handle this? Well, mainly through a series of really powerful preachers who decide we're not going to stay in really organized hierarchical churches. We're basically... We're taking it to the street. So five pastors in particular, there there are more than these, but I'm going to focus on these five pastors. They get out of their church and they kind of take it into the field. They begin preaching publicly in the streets, in prison, in the fields where farmhands can come and hear them. The five preachers are Jacobus Freelinghaus, a German-born Dutch-educated clergyman who came to Europe, excuse me, who came from Europe to Dutch settlers in North America. The Christian life, he said, demanded commitment and not dabbling, conversion, not middling. He expressed experiential Calvinism. Experiential Calvinism. We'll talk more about what I mean by that later. But think now what we talked about last week. Think pietism feeling the effects of becoming a Christian, feeling sin on you, feeling the battle against sin, feeling what redemption feels like. Not just this, but experiencing it. Uh, He has huge numbers of converts within the Dutch Reformed churches. Does Frelinghaus, I hope I'm saying his name right, the most famous of his converts is a man named Gilbert Tennant. T-E-N-N-E-N-T, Gilbert Tennant. Gilbert Tennant, 1703 to 1764. Preached a very similar message as Frelinghaus. He warns against flaccid spirituality, urges his hearers toward a more heartfelt faith. He's the second pastor, but it's these last three that I'm going to talk about. They are Jonathan Edwards. You guys know that name, I bet. George Whitfield, John Wesley. If you know your American church history, you're you're saying to yourself, John Wesley was only in the only in the colonies once. Why are you going to devote? And I am going to devote a big chunk to him. Why are you going to give him so much time? Because the effects of John Wesley were so momentous in the United States. I'm going to start with Edwards. Edwards is probably the greatest theological minds in American history. Perry Miller, one side note, Perry Miller was a Harvard historian who lived in the early part of the 20th century, early to mid part of the 20th century. Perry Miller almost single-handedly as a historian rescues the Puritans from being branded this narrow, bigoted, you know, know know-nothing group of religious settlers. Perry Miller, I don't know if what Perry Miller's religious convictions were, but he was a Harvard historian And he devotes his entire life to researching and writing about the Puritans. He really respects the Puritans. The book by Perry Miller is called Errand into the Wilderness. Um, Perry Miller is a great admirer of Jonathan Edwards, and he makes the case that Jonathan Edwards, yeah, he preached. Yeah, he um, was a pastor, but really he's an artist and he's working in the only medium that uh, an artist has access to in the colonies in the early part of the 1700s. That is Christianity and th- teaching Christianity through sermons and theology. That's the way that Perry Miller thinks of Jonathan Edwards. I think that's pretty helpful. Uh, Jonathan Edwards entered what would eventually be Yale University. 
at age 13. And he would die while serving as the third president of Princeton University, which was then known as the College of New Jersey. After graduating from Yale in 1720, he followed in his grandfather Solomon Studdard's footsteps. He goes into the ministry in New England, and he takes over his grandfather's church in 1729, rarely left his pulpit. Uh, he's best known for a sermon. You probably read it when you were in high school. Anybody remember the name of the sermon? Yep, Sinners of the Hands of an Angry God. Um, I'm going to read a portion of that. I'm also going to read a portion of one of his other sermons, which is called Heaven, a World of Love. So it's unfortunate that you only read Sinners of the Hands of an Angry God, which is this really powerful Jeremiah in which uh, Jonathan Edwards compares you to a spider hanging over the open candle flame and feeling the wrath of God underneath you. That's the only thing you read, maybe, from Jonathan Edwards. There's so much more to the guy. Um, and so I'm going to read another sermon of his that hopefully you'll see more of kind of like the full flowering of what Jonathan Edwards is about. So um, a couple sections from Jonathan Edwards. Uh, this was delivered in 1741. Your wickedness makes you heavy as lead. And if God should let you go, you would plunge into the bottomless gulf. In your healthy constitution and your own care and prudence and best contrivance and all of your righteousness would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a falling rock. Notice how visceral the language is. A, a spider's web holding a falling rock. I mean, can't you, you can see it, can't you? Um, a bottomless gulf. Uh, he uses really vivid language. And some of the uh, reason he might use such vivid language is because he's he really liked a guy named John Locke, a philosopher named John Locke. And John Locke is an empiricist. So without getting into empiricism, we'll probably talk more about it next week. Um, what you see and what you sense is what you get. That's the most important stuff. So for Jonathan Edwards, he wanted to make his congregation feel, see, smell what it, liked, what it felt like to be a Christian. So he's using really powerful language, and you read the stuff, and it is. It's really powerful. You, your, your skin starts to kind of move a little bit. Uh, here is another section from Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. The bow of God's wrath is bent. And the arrow is made ready on the string and justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow. And it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. This, oh, thus all that never passed under a great change of heart by the mighty power of the spirit of God upon your souls. All you that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from being dead in sin to a state of new and before altogether unexperienced light and life are in the hands of an angry God. Apparently, Edwards had to stop a few times during the delivery because the shrieks of agony are so loud from his congregation. While he's best remembered for that angry sermon, it's far from a complete sampling of his work. This one... Uh, is a sampling from Heaven, a World of Love. God is the fountain of love as the sun is the fountain of life. And therefore, the glorious presence of God in heaven fills heaven with love as the sun, placed in the midst of the visible heavens in a clear day, fills the world with light. The joy of heavenly love shall never be dampened by jealousy. In heaven, no one will doubt the love of each other. They won't fear that professions of love are hypocritical. They shall be perfectly satisfied of the sincerity and strength of each other's affection as if there were a window into every breast so that everything in the heart could be seen. There shall be no such thing as flattery or hypocrisy in heaven, but perfect, but perfect sincerity shall reign through all and in all. Everyone will be just what he seems to be. Everyone will really have all the love that he seems to have. 
It will not be as in the world, where comparatively few things are what they seem to be, where professions are often made lightly and without meaning, but there is every expression of love, but there every expression of love shall come from the bottom of the heart, and all that is professed shall be really and truly felt. That's great. I mean, the power with which he says, this is your situation, this is you before the hands of an angry God, he, what a beautiful counterpart he gives. I mean, wouldn't, it would be so great to be able to just trust your friends, to trust your acquaintances and say, yeah, I believe their professions of love and their actions toward me are actually coming from an absolutely sincere place. This is what heaven will be like, he says. As a young minister, he was troubled by the licentiousness he saw among New England youth, and he would visit youths in their home to talk about it. At, can you imagine Jonathan Edwards showing up at your door? <laughs> at 28 years of age, he delivered a sermon to a Boston audience that argued that sin was merely a condition of ignorance and moral inactivity, and salvation only a life lived in a reasonable accord with Christ's teaching. He was very troubled by spiritual self-reliance, so he was very reformed to believe in predestination. He did not believe in that we could earn our own salvation. And it troubled him that he saw many in New England believing this. Yes, yes. I'm asking about what self-reliance is. Yeah. So it's not necessarily he's talking about gathering a year's worth of firewood and being reliant on yourself to have fuel, but self-reliance in terms of making yourself worthy to get to heaven. Right, right. Yeah, he would he would not smile upon that. He might think that gathering wood for the winter is important, but that's a practical matter. That's not really what God is most concerned about. So he is not a Baptist. I mean, he only believes in free will in the way that the Reformers believe in free will. It's kind of the other side of the coin of predestination, of God's will, of God getting what he wants no matter what. So self-reliance would just be saying, it's only up to me. It's only, I can earn my way into salvation. I can earn my way into heaven. Edwards wouldn't, he wouldn't approve of that. Very worried about that. After Edwards' sermons, a great concern for godliness swept over, swept over Northampton. The town, wrote Edwards, seemed to be full of the presence of God. It never was so full of love nor so full of joy and yet as full of distress as it was then. There were remarkable tokens of God's presence in almost every home. Uh, Edwards published an account of the awakening. I'm going to use that word, awakening. This will be called the Great Awakening. He publishes this account in 1737. It's called A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God in the Conversion of Many Hundred Souls in Northampton. <laughs> Which prompted other ministers, uh, that's the end of the title, and this prompts many other ministers to attempt revivals in their own congregations. So this, this pamphlet, this little book that he writes, starts getting spread around. Eventually, John Wesley will read this pamphlet, but we'll get to there in a second. Uh, one British preacher who got a hold of Edward's account would become the most famous preacher and probably the most famous person in American history at the time. His name was George Whitfield, so it's spelled Whitefield, pronounced Whitfield. He had been preaching in England. Edwards heard about him, wrote him a letter, invited him to preach in New England. Whitfield comes across, and the results are pretty stunning. Uh, the first time he came to Boston, there was such a rush to see him that five people were trampled to death <laughs> in, in inauspicious beginning. Whitfield's beginnings were lowly. So a little bit about Whitfield's biography. Uh, his parents were rather disreputable innkeepers, and his critics loved to point out that he was born in an inn, to which he replied, so was Jesus. He was cross-eyed, in which cartoonists of uh, the day loved to point out, but his admirers responded, even his eyes make the sign of the cross. <laughs> <laughs> He was the first preacher, apparently, in American history to memorize his sermons. He'd write them out and then deliver them from memory. He kept an extensive diary, and in that diary, he was very, very critical of American preachers. Quote, I am verily persuaded that the generality of preachers talk to, 
talk of an unknown, unfelt Christ, and the reason why congregations have been so dead is because dead men preach to them. <laughs> Despite that, now that's his dire, okay? He's not going public with that. <laughs> Uh, he is very good at public relations. He would print and ship poster to towns where he would preach, informing people that when and where he would be speaking. He carried a collapsible pulpit with him wherever he went. And he was the first to take Christianity outdoors. The crowds were far too big to fit in any building. And apparently his preaching was just unforgettable. So there's an account of a farmer from Connecticut named Nathan Cole who wrote a long diary entry about going to see Whitfield. Uh, He heard that Whitfield was going to preach in New Haven. So he and his wife with their one horse were desperate to see him. Apparently he would, uh, Nathan Cole, his wife would start riding on the horse and he'd be leading the horse and then they'd switch for a little while and they'd switch back. So here's his diary entry from October 23rd, 1740. One morning, there came a messenger that said, Mr. Whitfield was preaching at Middleton this morning. I was in my field at work. I dropped my tool that I had in my hand, ran home, and bade my wife get ready quick to go and hear Mr. Whitfield preach at Middleton. Then I ran for my horse with all of my might, fearing that I should be too late to hear him. I brought my horse home and soon mounted and took up my wife and went forth as fast as I could as fast as I thought the horse could bear. When my horse began to be out of breath, I would get down and put my wife on the saddle and bid her ride as fast as she could and not stop or slack for me, except I bade her. And so I would run until I was much out of breath, then mount my horse again, and so I did several, as if we were fleeing for our lives, all the while fearing that we should be a little too late to hear the sermon, for we had 12 miles to ride, double in little more than an hour. Man, that's a good haul. When I saw Mr. Whitfield come up on the scaffold, he looked almost angelic. A young, slim, slender youth before some thousands of people with a bold, undaunted countenance. In my hearing how God was with him and every, was with him everywhere as he came along, it solemnized my mind and put me into a trembling fear before he began to preach. For he looked as if he were clothed with the authority from the great God himself. And a sweet, solemn solemnity sat upon his brow. Hearing him preach gave me a heart wound. By God's blessing, my old foundation was broken up. I saw that my righteousness would not save me. I was convinced of the doctrine of election and went right to quarreling with God about it. Because all that I could do would not save me. And he had decreed from eternity who would be saved and who not. Uh, End of quote. Somebody else would go hear uh, Whitfield speak and also recorded in his diary, Ben Franklin. Franklin uh, heard Whitfield, heard that Whitfield was preaching to crowds as large as 30,000 people. 30,000 people, he doesn't have a mic. So there's something about the tenor and power of his voice that he can carry a long way. I went to William Jennings Bryan College, and one of the things they say about Brian, William Jennings Bryan, who was also renowned for speaking to huge crowds, being a great public speaker, um, apparently he had some, a somewhat high-pitched voice, and his high-pitched voice enabled him to speak, to kind of project even farther. So people wonder if Whitfield also had a, like a higher-pitched voice. Um, Whitfield is pretty skeptical. Whitfield is a de- – excuse me, Whitfield. Franklin is a deist, and he's kind of skeptical about Whitfield. Um, he just wants to go see, a, see Whitfield more as a circus act than anything else. So Whitfield comes to Philadelphia, and uh, Franklin is determined that he's going to go, but he's not going to bring any money because Whitfield will ask at the end of his sermons for a collection because he supports an orphanage. And Franklin's like, he's not going to get any money. I'm leaving my wallet at home. So uh, he shows up to this uh, crowd in Philadelphia, and Franklin's determined that he is going to walk around the circumference of the crowd to try to estimate how many people are there. And he says he walks all the way on the outer perimeter of the people, and he estimates eventually 20,000 people are hearing him preach. And he said he was never beyond Whitfield's voice the whole time. He could hear him even though he was on the outskirts of the crowd. So Franklin in his autobiography wrote that he, when he went to go see Whitfield, would not take any money. 
So he would not be tempted to give any to Whitfield because Whitfield, he knew what a powerful speaker Whitfield was. But he forgot to leave his wallet at home, and he actually accidentally takes $10. After Whitfield starts preaching, Franklin says to himself, well, maybe I'll just give him the copper coins. Then after a few more wonderful lines by Whitfield, Franklin thinks, well, okay, maybe my silver as well. Then before the sermon is over, Whitfield is making the call to support his orphanage. Franklin decides that he'll give him everything that he has, gold, silver, and gold coins. And eventually he goes, he borrows money from a friend to give him even more money. <laughs> and apparently Franklin and Whitfield were fast friends after this. They, they started a friendship and they were made friends till the end of uh, their lives. Like Jonathan Edwards, Whitfield used startling images to make his listeners feel the pain of sin and the terrors of hell. And then, with tears in his eyes, he could describe the love of Christ until his audience cried with him for forgiveness. One famous actor of the day, I think he was a British actor, David Garrick said, I would give a hundred guineas just to say, oh, like Mr. Whitfield. <laughs> Uh, this develops a problem, though. You can imagine if you're an Anglican pastor, you've been trained all this time in theology. You've gone to Oxford, maybe you've gone to Cambridge, and now you came over to the United States. Um, you're part of an organized church, and here comes this guy, this cross-eyed street preacher who goes out there and basically creates havoc. So there develops this friction between what are called the old lights and the new lights. The old lights are members of the established church and they do not like Whitfield. They do not like Edwards. They will not like John Wesley. They do not like the revivalist preachers. Um, the new lights are the people who say, no, this is great. People are converting by the thousands. This is wonderful. Let's embrace this. So um, there's a story about Lord Chesterfield, who I think was an English barrister. And back in Great Britain, people were talking about George Whitfield, and several British leaders went to Lord Chesterfield, and they're like, listen, we need to do something about this guy's evangelistic preaching. And Chesterfield said, I've got a very simple solution. Make him a bishop. You'll silence him immediately. <laughs> and there's a lot of power in this suggestion, right? Um, because there's this divide that's developing in the United States between any form of hierarchy. It, well, there's not a divide. Any form of hierarchy is being viewed with extreme suspicion. So going out and preaching in the street, preaching in the fields, that's welcome. That's democratic. That's the way that we do it. This stodgy, um, hierarchical, popish religion, Anglicanism, has the taint of that still. And the Americans are moving swiftly away from Anglicanism, very quickly away from that. Um, okay. So that's George Whitfield. Our th last preacher that we'll talk about is a man named John Wesley, who knew George Whitfield because they were in a club together at Oxford University as young men. The club's name, <laughs> not chosen by them, was the Holy Club. I'll talk more about the Holy Club in one second. John Wesley was born in 1703 to Samuel and Susanna Wesley. Susanna bore 19 children. John was number 15. His brother Charles was the 18th. Apparently, her kids loved her. She was very strict got them up before daybreak, a cold, sparse diet, strict corporal punishment, supervised their education. Her kids loved her, thought she was great. Uh, involved in all sorts of ministries outside the home and out in, in their church. Uh, his father, on the other hand, was a high church Tory parson. Pretty autocratic. One night at the dinner table, when Wesley was a boy, his father blessed the food and finished the prayer by saying, God bless the king, to which his wife said nothing. When she did not say amen, Wesley's father said, you didn't say amen. And his mother said, I don't recognize William of Orange as my king. Because William of Orange had split the British monarchy. 
um, she believed, and thus she wouldn't recognize him. So Wesley's father, Samuel, said, if you don't recognize my king, we shall not share a bed. So he moved from his bedroom until Queen Anne replaced William of Orange a few months later. (laughs) Samuel, I mention this for a reason. Samuel had very strong political opinions. His opinions were so unpopular that his parishioners vandalized their home, catching their house on fire one night. All of the family except John escape. Neighbors get up on each other's shoulders, reach into the burning building, pull John out as the parsonage collapse, apparently. So his mother, Susanna, would frequently remind John of this and say that God had preserved him for some sort of righteousness, for some sort of service. John would later refer to himself as a firebrand plucked from the fire. When he goes to Oxford in 1720, he takes his brother Charles with him. Oxford is increasingly deistic. We're going to talk about deism a lot next week, but Oxford is increasingly deistic. The short version of what deism is, um, the view is that God, God's relationship to the world is that of a watchmaker who makes the clock, winds it, and puts it on its shelf to run by its own natural laws, but doesn't interfere. So things like the mir- like miracles, well, those don't really happen according to nature. Miracles are out. Uh, so uh, some of the founding fathers, some of the most influential founding fathers will be deists, and you'll see some of the kind of peculiar things, particularly John uh, Thomas Jefferson does, to kind of try to make Christianity much more deistic. So Oxford, at the time that John and Charles Wesley go to college, is increasingly deistic. Uh, John starts a devotional club. He draws up a group, uh, a, a plan of study for his little group, stressing prayer, Bible reading, and frequent partaking of communion. They sought together to emulate the lives of early Christians. John would make a catalog of his weaknesses, and he would establish rules for overcoming them. He gave to the poor. He visited the imprisoned. He read devotional and mystical classics like Jeremy Taylor's Holy Living, Thomas Akempis' Imitation of Christ, William Law's Serious Call to a Holy Life, and students mocked them mercilessly, apparently calling them the Bible Moths, the Reforming Club, the Holy Club, and sometimes the Methodists. So John is doing all these things. Uh, he will go, after he graduates from Oxford, to Savannah, Georgia, to a colony that's starting there. He's invited by an Anglican minister, and he's going to be a mission, a missionary to the colonists and the natives that are living in Savannah. But inwardly, John is basically a mess. Um, he has this sense that he has no sense of peace. He's in deep anguish all the time. So he's kind of doing all these things that he thinks will kind of lead him toward this godly life full of peace and inner understanding, but that's not what's happening. While he's on the boat to go to Savannah, they run into a violent storm. How many of you guys know the story of John Wesley? Okay, a few of you. This is really interesting stuff. He's 32 years old. He boards a ship bound for Savannah, Georgia. The ship called the Simmons runs into a violent storm, and Wesley is terrified. However, there's a little group on deck that are all praying together, and in the middle of this violent storm, they're not sweating it at all. They're totally at peace. So the storm eventually blows over. John goes over to them. They're a group of Moravians. Think, I mentioned last week the pietists, simple Christian living. That's what the Moravians are. They're pietists. He goes and he asks the leader of the Moravians, he said, Um, were you scared? The Moravian says, no. Wesley says, well, surely your women and children were afraid. No, our women and children were not afraid to die. So Wesley is struck by this. How could they have this deep sense of peace that he clearly does not have? He would later reflect that this is the most glorious day in his life, but he doesn't really understand what's going on yet. It's going to take a few years before he really kind of has that peace for himself. The trip to Georgia was a total disaster. He expected the American Indians to be very noble, 
but in his private diary, he found them to be gluttons, thieves, liars, and murderers. He said the American colonists resented his high church ways. He refused to conduct a funeral for a nonconformist, someone who was not Anglican. He's just, I'm not even going to do their funeral for them. He prohibited ladies' fancy dresses and jewelry in church, and he falls in love madly with a girl named Sophie Hopkins, 18 years old, who is the niece of the chief magistrate in Savannah, Georgia. But she doesn't love John, and she, in fact, elopes with John's chief rival. Then they come to communion one day, and John is serving communion. John doesn't serve them communion. (laughs) Sophie's husband sued John for defaming her character, and six months later, John flees Georgia. He wrote on his way home, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? 35 years old, he's back in England, he's sad, he's discredited. For 12 years, he sought to emulate the best Christian models, but he ended up, in his words, a spiritual bankrupt. The only positive experience was meeting the Moravians. So when he's in London one day, he visits a Moravian preacher, and this Moravian preacher impresses upon Wesley the need for a new birth. Justification by faith is not merely a doctrine, but a personal experience, a feeling of God's forgiveness. So this is going to be a very important trend in American church history. It's not just, it's that when a person converts, it's not just assenting to a set of doctrines, but it is also feeling those doctrines in some way. This will become very important in American church history. So this Moravian pastor impresses this upon John Wesley. Wesley still doesn't understand this. He doesn't know what the pastor is saying until a year later, and he undergoes his famous Aldergate Street experience. This is, this is if you have any acquaintance with the Methodists, you know about John Wesley's Aldergate Street experience, February of 1738. Uh, a quote from his journal, from John Wesley's journal. Quote, In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistles of the Romans. About a quarter to nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Three days before John John Wesley's Aldergate Street experience, His brother Charles has a a very, very similar experience just three days earlier. John will go on to become a great hymnist. Do you guys, you guys probably know this about John Wesley? Um, he is the author or translator of about 4,000 hymns. Uh, here are four hymns that you probably know. Hark the Herald Angel Sing, written by Charles. Oh, 4,000 tongues to sing. Christ the Lord is risen today. Come thou long expected Jesus. Um, Not long after the Aldersgate meeting, John is walking from London to Oxford and he's reading a pamphlet by Jonathan Edwards about mass conversions taking place in Massachusetts. And John Wesley is thrilled about this. A few weeks later, he's invited by a former Holy Club member, George Whitfield, to preach with him at mine work to mine workers in Bristol, England. And apparently at this preaching, Wesley undergoes another radical transformation when he's preaching to these uh, mine workers in Bristol. He apparently is a fairly timid guy before this. And after this, he's just, he's a firebrand. He's indomitable. He's just a machine. Um, so here are just some of the things that John Wesley did in his life. He traveled on average about 4,500 miles a year. I mean, this is all on horseback or walking. So that means in his lifetime, he, he aver, excuse me, in his lifetime, he totaled probably 250,000 miles or 10 times around the planet. 
He would travel on horseback. He would read books and prepare sermons on his way to the next town. He would preach in jails to prisoners, at inns to wayfarers, on on vessels crossing to Ireland, in natural amphitheaters to over 30,000 people. Basically, if he was, if he was breathing, he was preaching. He was about five foot three and weighed about 130 pounds and he ends up living, I think, to his mid eighties. Uh, he was involved and by involved, I mean escaping from 50 to 100 riots. <laughs> Some of these riots were started by pastors in the area who didn't want him preaching in their parish. Here's what he wrote in his journal, June 1739, defending his freelance preaching. Quote, God in scripture commands me, according to my power, to instruct the ignorant, reform the wicked, and confirm the virtuous. Man forbids me to do this in another's parish, that is, in effect, to do it at all, seeing as I have no parish of my own, nor probably ever will, whom shall I hear, God or men? Uh, We'll close with some of Wesley's unique convictions, and then the effects of the Great Awakening. Uh, At the beginning of his ministry, John Wesley was largely just straight-up Anglican or Puritan, especially in his moral beliefs. He stressed the conflict with sin. He stressed salvation only through Jesus Christ. But later he would come to differ from the Anglicans in this way. He moved away from predestination and toward free will. And he also went away from reformed slash Puritan theology and that he preached and believed in Christian perfection, that you could be perfect in this life. He believed that there were two blessings. The first blessing was believing in Christ, you receive justification meaning God saves you in that moment. You're justified. That's the first blessing. But there's a second blessing. That is sanctification. Internally understanding one's justification and becoming a better person through God's influence. So this first and second blessing, so think about John Wesley's life. He's trying so hard for so long. He believes that Christ is his savior. He believes that God has saved him, but it just doesn't register internally, right? Then at Aldersgate, all of a sudden, he gets it. He he gets it on an emotional level even. So he develops this kind of theology that says that's the normal thing. That happens for all of us or ought to happen or hopefully will happen for all of us. We might believe in justification. That's the first blessing, but there's a second blessing that has to come and that second blessing makes us understand it internally, helps us understand it internally. If any of you guys are familiar with uh, the holiness movement or the Pentecostal movement, this should start to sound kind of familiar, that um, when the holiness movement comes around in the early 20th century, they will say that that second blessing that John Wesley experienced will actually also probably come with some signs, like speaking in tongues or a gift of healing or something like that. We'll talk more about that um, later in the class. John Wesley stressed practical Christianity. Methodists, in my experience, are the most helpful denomination (laughs) that I've ever run across. I used to teach uh, a youth group. Um, My high schoolers came from all sorts of different denominations, and whenever I needed something done, I knew that I had like my little handful of Methodists Catherine and Taylor and some of the others. And if I needed to get something done, I'd be like, hey, Catherine, Taylor, could you go? Absolutely. What, what can we do? How can we help? I think Methodist, that's, I think that's um, a direct outflowing of John uh, Wesley's emphasis on um, being a practical in your Christian life, being helpful in just your everyday activities. Um, he really emphasized lay leadership and equipping just everyday people to do the work of Christianity not hierarchical. He formulated, did John Wesley, practical Christian organizations. He differentiated workers by gifts. There were exhorters, lay preachers, administrators, etc. Um, he provided a hierarchical structure, yes, but it's very dynamic. 
It's not a static hierarchy. Um, the meetings of classes and societies were constantly being obsessed individually and collectively. Is this working for our spiritual lives? I think that's still kind of part of the legacy of uh, Methodists. Another um, effect of John Wesley, he, um, oh, he becomes the father of the, and grandfather of the holiness movement. I said enough about that. We'll talk about more, uh, we'll talk about that in subsequent weeks. He dies in 1791, and when he dies in 1791, he still considers himself an Anglican, a member of the Church of England. He doesn't want to separate, but given what I've told you about Methodism, there's no way that Methodism, with its kind of like um, the, the spirit of the laity being involved, street preaching, there's no way that that Methodism is going to peacefully coexist with Anglicanism. So a few years after John Wesley dies, the Methodist, excuse me, the Wesleyan Anglicans separate off and they become the Methodists. When he died in 1791, there were roughly 150,000 Methodists. About 80,000 were in England. The rest were in the United States. 170 years later, one, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, 40, I'm, I'm butchering this. I wanted to have like this big pail of like, how did it grow that fast? So 1791, 150,000 Methodists, 170 years later, 40 million Methodists. It explodes, absolutely explodes. Methodism, coupled with the Great Awakening, provide a major shift in the church landscape. Fewer and fewer Anglicans and Presbyterians, more and more Methodists and Baptists, and an increasing democratization of the church, increasingly democ uh, an increasingly democratized church. Uh, last thing to say about John Wesley's life, then we'll close with just a couple of things about the Great Awakening. Um, last letter he ever wrote was to a British abolitionist named William Wib Wilberforce. Do you guys know the story of William Wilberforce? So apparently Wesley is on his deathbed. He's politically, Wesley's just status quo. He's probably a Tory, um, but he hates slavery, hates it. And he sees its effects in the United or in the colonies, so he writes a letter asking that William Wilberforce, who's an English abolitionist, kind of keep fighting uh, against slavery. If you know William Wilberforce's life, the British Parliament passes an, the anti-slavery law the day that William Wilberforce dies. It's, it's kind of an amazing story. Okay, we'll close with this. Oh my goodness, I've gone over time. Thank you. Um, the effects of the Great Awakening, revivalist preaching becomes a norm, a mainstay of American Christianity. The Great Awakening was urban, not rural. Now, Whitfield and others preached in the fields, but it's primarily an urban movement. It's happening in cities. It reaches both upper classes and lower classes. <coughs> White preachers begin for the first time in earnest to attempt to convert black slaves. And the Great Awakening helps break down sectarianism. So the great preachers of the time come from different denominations. They don't really care. They all work together. There's some quibbling over um, the fact that Whitfield and Edwards believe so strongly in God's sovereignty, in predestination. Wesley does not. They'll quibble over that later, but for the most part, they're working together happily. Um, and sectarianism breaks down, denominationalism uh, becomes kind of the new norm. A quote from John Wesley, I refuse to be distinguished from other men by anything other than the common principles of Christianity. I renounce and detest all other marks of distinction. But from real Christians, whatever denomination, I earnestly desire not to be distinguished at all. Dost thou love and fear God? That is enough. I give thee the right hand of fellowship. Um, okay, let's end there because I've already taken you guys over. Questions or comments? The Great Awakening is going to fold right into the, the revolution, the American Revolution 
next week, I will cover that. I've got notes left on that, but rather than go into those notes, I'll cover that next week. So I read Wesley's A Plain Account of Christian Perfection, and it, it wasn't clear to me whether or not he thought that sinless perfection happened immediately upon the point of sanctification. So he talks about the second blessing, and sometimes it almost sounds like a process, and sometimes mm-hmm. it sounds like it just happens to mm-hmm. you, and you're you're perfect after that. Yeah. So. I, th- I think Wesley thought that it was a process. So the second blessing would happen. That's what happened to him at Aldersgate. Um, but one could progress and eventually become perfect. I don't think that he thought with the second blessing came perfection. I think that will develop later in holiness and Pentecostal theology, but not, not from him. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions? Thank you very much. See you next week.